Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Well, welcome everyone to the Essential Bible Studies podcast. My name is Stephen McFarlane. My name is Tim Young. We're uh, happy that you're joining us for this session. We're going to be focusing on Genesis 2 and verse 7, and specifically on creation and the soul. Well, Tim, this is really a fundamental topic to certainly wrestle through as Bible students. Absolutely. And we know that considerations from Genesis are really, it's the seedbed of the Bible. It cements the bedrock of a lot of the considerations and the verses that we would look at as, as Bible students. So I think both of I've us, even heard say that all of our first principles are in the first four chapters, at least the first 12 chapters mm-hmm. of Genesis. That's how important they are. Yeah, so it's certainly, I, I think we we're both sharing the excitement to walk through uh, this subject in particular and, and some of these verses that we'll, we'll look through. You know, really, I, th- I think a helpful place for us to start is just to kind of lay the foundation on, on why we would look into this subject and this verse in particular. Sure. The creation of man. Why yeah. is it so important? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, why is it that we should take this so seriously? And, and really, if we wanted to justify the time that we're going to put into to our considerations tonight, or, or for those that are listening, a helpful place for us to start is actually in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 15. And in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, we have a wonderful verse that really lays the framework for any consideration of the Word of God. Right. We read there, it says, for whatsoever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And I love this verse, Tim, because I've heard it heard once before, there's certain speed bump verses in God's word. Speed bump verses. Yeah, I know know the look (laughs) I'm getting from you. But let me just explain real quick. So if you think of, of yourself driving in a car, and you're approaching a speed bump, the first thing you do is typically take your foot off the gas. (laughs) You should. Sure. You approach slowly, cautiously. You feel yourself as you go over this speed bump. You feel its effects. In the same way that when we approach certain verses from the Word of God, it's important for us not to just rush through our study and consideration of it. It's one thing to think, hey, you know what? I'll start in Genesis. I'll get to Revelation so I can fold it, cover up, put it back on the shelf, and at least say, check, I've read the Bible. There's verses, there's considerations that we should actually take the time to appreciate and to slow down as we read certain verses. And this is one of them. And I think the now, reason... I've, I've hit a speed bump very fast, and it wasn't yeah. a pleasant experience. Yeah, so I, right. I, I, I can associate with yeah. what you're saying here. So in the Bible, that's that's a really cool idea. Just like yeah, it's a help- slow down and really pay attention to this this verse. It's really important. And this is a really helpful one for us to think through because you know the, the phrase that it was written for our instruction, it, it's encouraging for us as we think through these things. That even the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 it was written so that we might learn something from it. It's going to instruct us, and hopefully we'll be able to to uncover that a little bit. And then you look at that word in in Romans 15 and verse 4, it says that through endurance, Mm. it's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Right, Right. It's going to take time, and I think this is a helpful thing for us as Bible students to appreciate early on. It's not always the quick and easy answer that's going to be the most helpful. Right. Sometimes you have to spend some time to wrestle through that section and that verse. And, you know, I think of, of the analogy of a gift where, you know, if I was to put a gift in front of you, Tim, you have really have two options with it. You can sit back and take a look at the gift and that's it. You just look at the outside wrapping paper, the bow, the way it's presented to you and say, oh, this is excellent. Thank you very much. And you take the gift and that's it. Or you can actually unwrap it. You can open it up and see what's actually inside. And so for us, we can either look at this verse in in Genesis 2 and verse 7, and we can say, okay, I see what's on the outside, and that's good. I'll move on to Genesis 2 and verse 8 and continue on my way. Or we can stop, approach it as a speed bump, and start to dig in just a little bit deeper. Let's unwrap some of the layers together. And I I think that's what you and I are looking forward to to doing in the next few minutes together. Yeah, because we're just dealing with this kind of really small verse right here, but... When you come at these things, and I love that analogy of a speed bump, you just want to stop and you want to start asking questions. 
And so in this case, we might just be asking like who and why and, and what and how, because, you know, why, why did God write this down? He wrote certain things down and he didn't write other things down that we're curious about, but what he did write down, we, we got to be asking questions. So maybe we'll start at the who. Yeah. Excellent. Right? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's a good way for us to go through it, just breaking down some of the components uh, of this verse. And so, to your point, l- let's walk through that. Who is actually involved in this verse, in Genesis 2 and verse 7? Who performed this creative act? I read it. It just says, the Lord God formed the man. If we get out our concordances, mm-hmm. like we've talked about and do our little Bible study, we see that word, your Lord, the word Lord is Yahweh. And the word God is Elohim. Mm-hmm. Now, these are really important words to go back to. And we, we find that the word Elohim denotes uh, a power uh, or power of mighty ones. It's actually been translated in certain parts as rulers mm-hmm. or, or judges. And so it's, it's used not just of God, but in anybody who has that rule or power authority. And in this sense, we also see in Genesis an aspect of the the angels at work. So there is this, what we call a God manifestation, that the the angels are, are God's messengers. They're his, his fingers in creation. And we can see that a little bit. There's a little hint of it in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, where it says, let us make man in our image. Now, this, this is a whole nother story topic here, but that to me really signifies, and I think there's good reason for, for it from scripture, is that the us there, in the plural, is the angels. So God speaks, and the angels perform his word, right? So the, it, it's interesting just to think of that in creation, that it's just the Lord God, but it's him using his angels to do all his creative bidding. In fact, there's a there's a verse in Psalm, mm-hmm. Psalm 103, verses 20 through 21, which really brings this across. Let me just read it to you. It says, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. So we know the angels have always been there from the beginning, and that's their purpose, is to do the will of God. And here they're called his His mighty ones, and they're obeying his voice. And so when we say God said, or God spoke, let there be, Mm -hmm. the angels then did that work. So when we try to get the whole kind of picture here, uh, the who is the angels at work. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Tim, too, because... That in and of itself, that verse in Genesis 1, let us make man, that can be a a confusing verse just on its own. Right. But because you're introducing something new, well, who is this plural aspect? But as you just walked through, the Bible, the verses fit as a puzzle. And so when you start now incorporating, you look at the definition and the concordance as you talked through before, you start to look at the way it's used in other places in, in Genesis 28 and Genesis 32, and you tie in that verse that you read out in, in Psalm 103, you start to see the way the puzzle pieces fit together to form this complete picture of those, the angels, working on the behest of God, as it said there, to do his will. Now that's a nice way to kind of frame out the who mm-hmm. back in Genesis 2 and verse 7. So now what about the what? Yeah, it's certainly. What the what? Yeah, it's, it's, the, next, it's the next logical question for us to kind of work through. What actually happened? So now you have these angels. Well, what did the angels, what did they actually do in performing the will of God? What actually happened in this verse? And we see it again. You just read the verse to start with, approach it slowly. And it says that they formed the man. And I love the way that this verse, this, this phrase is defined for us. It's defined as squeezing into shape or to mold into form as a potter. And you think about the intricate detail. What word is that? With squeezing into shape? Formed? Is formed. That, has that idea? Yeah, formed. And so you think about it. You know, I'm sure many of us have either seen a potter or watched some you know, clip or video right. of, of a potter working on the pottery, right. on the clay. And you think of the intricate detail, how intimate that actually is. A potter that's working on that clay, that's actually shaping and forming it. And so this was an intimate process of very careful design. 
And, and this was something that was performed by the angels, fulfilling the will of God in, in doing this, in forming this man and spending the time to, to mold into form or into shape. You know, there's another aspect to this too, when you think that this is dirt, like he's, he's just taking clay, just earth hmm. and forming it together, right? So it's, it's the dust. And that's very humbling just to think, because man wants to elevate himself as something that's going to live forever and be beyond everything. But really, when it comes down to it, we're just dust. And that's what the, the Bible says. I mean, when, when Adam's condemned, God says, you will return to the ground for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's in Genesis 3 verse 19. And then if you think about that, that should really affect our attitudes. And it affected the attitude of somebody like Abraham, who when he talked to God, he says, you know, who am I but dust and ashes Mm. to talk to God? Even he recognized it. Even he recognized that. And when we come before God, this we have to realize that from Genesis two verse seven, that's all we are is is dust, unless we have this spirit, this breath of life that comes in and empowers us, right? So that's really the next thing we want to talk about here. That's the next element yeah. in Genesis two seven, right? Yeah. So you know, kind of the natural progression is is now to ask how this was actually accomplished, and thankfully, again. Part of the incredible thing about the Word of God is you, you just have to keep reading. You know, I, I always kind of think when you think about a book or, or something you might get from from a library, from a bookstore, as you try to unpack some of the components, typically they'll they'll lead you off with you know there's a well there's a second release coming or you have to head to the bookstore for another volume. <laughs> the, the wonder with the Word of God is just keep reading the verse. So as we try to answer some of these questions, it's all right here. So how was this accomplished? And you know, Tim, you already kind of talked through some of them. It was accomplished through the dust of the ground, the the dry earth as it's defined. It denotes this powder. And again, mm. to your point, just consider the power of God. You know, from the very beginning here in Genesis 2, God sets the table as to kind of this hierarchy of humbling man to understand where God is and kind of in comparison and his power and his authority and what he's able to do with dry earth to form man from the dust of the ground. God can do certainly what we see as absolutely impossible. And we know that to be true. There's verses that speak to that, that things that are impossible to us are possible with God. And I think what's incredible about this is if you get that understanding here in Genesis 2, it opens up so much of the rest of scripture because everything else that God lays out for us and his promises, we now take as fact. We have a belief and a faith in God and what he can accomplish. Mm -hmm. And every other thing that he promises, we know it's going to come to pass on account of what he was able to do back here in Genesis. It sets the scene. Again, it's the bedrock for the rest of scripture for us. And so, you know, the second aspect of this, this breath of life, man was formed from the dust of the ground and God breathed this breath of life. And so God gave life through this breath. And sometimes this is easy for us to forget. We just, you wake up and you know, you're, you're still breathing. You get up and, you know, away you go off to, to, you know, do your daily grind. And it was interesting because there was actually a billboard in the UK a few years ago and it, it took this aspect for granted. And it was a billboard that just simply read in the beginning, man created God. What? <laughs> yeah. And I, I think sometimes, you know, this, that couldn't be further from the truth. And oh, we forget yeah. this humility aspect of, of, you know, the, the actual hierarchy here. God breathed into man the breath of life. Of, of ourselves, this would have never been possible. Right. It isn't possible. And yet with God, he was able to do this out of the dust of the ground and breathe into this, this being, this breath of life. It's an incredible thing to think about. It is because like with all our science and with all our advancements, we still have absolutely no idea what life is. I mean, what, what powers us, what makes us breathe, you know, what makes us die. I mean, they're trying as hard as they can to figure it out. Mm-hmm. But it's just not even close. Mm-hmm. That's the, the wonder of it all. Yeah. And, you know, without it, like you said, take that breath away. And what happens? Well, we die. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And you don't have to take our word for it. <laughs> yeah. The Bible actually spells that out for us. Right. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 explicitly tells us that. We read there, it says, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit 
returns to God who gave it. So the spirit, the breath returns to God when we die. He has the power to give life and to take it away. Uh, That's a really great verse. I think it's, yeah, we kind of have to focus in on that because when it says the spirit returns to God, it's God's spirit. It's not like our spirit, like it's kind of separate or something like that. And just to to back that up, there's there's another passage, and this is in Job chapter 34, and it's verses 14 and 15. And there, this is a character, Elihu, who tells us, you can tell he's drawing from Genesis 2, verse 7 right here. He says, if he, that is, if God should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. So you can see how he's picking up on Genesis 2, 7 and that Genesis 3, verse 19 passage about what, what man is. But it very specifically said it's God gathers to himself his spirit and his breath. And that's the interesting thing about this word breath. Mm-hmm. It's the word neshama, the breath of life, neshama kai, often used interchangeably with the word Hebrew word ruach, which means spirit. Mm-hmm. And so, which also has the idea of breath or wind, and so they're used interchangeably about what has actually animated this, this d- dust of the ground, this dirt, and given it life. It's the spirit of God. It's just the power that animates all living beings, you know, whoever they are, man or animals, right? Yeah. Again, we see the the puzzle pieces of scripture just fitting so nicely right. together it's as consistent you wrap those across, verses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so. Again, you know, to, to the verses you just walked us through, we see in this creative act, God breathes into to man this breath of life, has the ability to give life and to take it away. And yet we're led again to this next question. If God breathed into man this breath of life, well, why? What's this all for? What's this all about? Mm. And so I think, you know, again, as we kind of continue on in the reading, we kind of get now to that that so what question that so many people love to ask. Well, what's the purpose of all of this? And so what, Stephen? Yeah, why why was this done? And so you you know we we see there it says that man became a living creature. Mm-hmm. And in other versions of the Bible, it says man became a living soul. So it's simply just it's a living creature, a living body, a living person and You know, Tim, this is an interesting point for us, especially as Bible students, because when you read this verse, this is really where you're presented with a bit of a fork in the road in terms of your understanding. As you're unwrapping this present of this verse of of Genesis 2 and verse 7, digging a little bit deeper, you're really presented right now with two ways of thinking. Because we see that man became a living creature. And so the question that I would pose to you would be, well, does that mean living forever? What does that actually mean? Do you, does man live forever? Is there a finite time? Does this soul aspect actually continue to carry on? And, you know, a helpful exercise to actually go through as you think through this aspect of the soul and whether or not it lives forever. I'll give you just a few minutes to actually locate the word immortal soul in your Bible. Cause that's a helpful place for us to start. If we were to kind of walk down this Avenue and this fork in the so, road. So you're asking the question, is there something inherent in man that's immortal? That God has created here, mm-hmm. an immortal soul. Mm-hmm. So I bring up my concordance. I'm looking for this phrase, immortal soul. Well, I'll tell you what, just for those that are listening in, we won't waste their time <laughs> or yours. You won't find it. Okay. And that's that's what's kind of interesting about as you, as you go through this consideration, this expression, immortal soul, is never found in the Bible. And so once again, the Bible is so clear on these fundamental uh, teachings that God has laid out for us that we see come out here in in Genesis 2 and verse 7. As man became a living soul, the Bible is actually very clear on on what then happens. Souls die. We know that. Scripture is very clear on that. Okay, so the Bible does say that souls die in more than one place, but the, the one that really pops to my mind is Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. It says there, this is God. He says, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. 
That covers all of us, I would say, yeah, safely. <laughs> and it's so important. It's actually repeated later on in the mm. chapter in, in verse 20. And so this word soul, it's kind of like, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Like, how would you define what a soul is? To me, it's, just, it's, a, it's a person. It's just who you are. You are a soul. You're a being. That's why some translations just translate it, man became a living being or man became a living creature. They don't actually word the soul, right? But in other places in the Bible, they might even just translate it with a personal pronoun uh, as a person, right? And that's, you got to wrap your head around that. It's the way that the Hebrews thought about this word, the word is actually nephesh in the Hebrew. And so it's just who you are as a person. It's your personality altogether with your form and, and who you are. So we see this equation in Genesis 2, verse 7, that you have the dust of the earth plus the breath of life equals a living soul, mm. right? And if you're out in the math, right? Equations, equations, right? Yes. If you take away the breath of life, you subtract it, then what do you have? You have a, a dead soul. It's not a living soul mm-hmm. anymore. It's a dead soul. It's just, it's it's a living person versus, versus a dead person. If you come back to this Ezekiel 18 verse 4 verse, I don't know why the ESV didn't just translate it that way. Uh, it would have been very true to the kind of word. Behold, everybody, all people are mine. Every person that sins will die, mm-hmm. right? And that's, an, uh, you know, again, for the third time in this podcast, mm-hmm you're kind of forced to just stand in awe at the wonder of the word of God. Because you could come to this verse and be a little scared off or frightened at what it seems to be putting forward for us. And, you know, the thoughts, okay, man became a living soul. What does happen? Does this live forever? And yet all you have to do is just keep reading. Continue to, to look through the word of God, look through other places in scripture. You'll come to the likes of Ezekiel 18 and verse four. And then as you said, it's repeated again in verse 20. And again, you can take great comfort. There's other, there's other verses to go to. Another one is Psalm 146 verses three and four, that when the breath departs, our thoughts perish. There's nothing remaining, nothing left. It actually says there, put not your trust in princes in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. And again, in other translations, it's the thoughts that perish. There's yeah. there's nothing left. This soul, this person, it's finite, and there's an ending to it. And so you know, you're kind of left with this feeling that you almost have another so what question in your mind. But I think before we get to that, Tim, if you could just kind of, what, what have we looked through so far? If we were to kind of take the pieces that we've unwrapped together from Genesis 2 and verse 7. What are some of the components that we've just kind of gone through so far together just to kind of put it uh, into a nice little package so far? So the who was the angels. We were made in the image and likeness of God, which involves the angels, the the Elohim. Uh, The what was formed of the dust of the ground. We saw how important that actually is for our consideration, our humility, to see how God formed us miraculously. The what is the breath of life breathed into the nostrils, which takes this clay and just this breath comes in and just just lives right through the, the power and the, the spirit of God. And that then becomes the why. It becomes a living soul. It becomes a person who is made in the image and likeness of God and for the purpose of God is meant to glorify him, right? Isn't that amazing? What's all just hidden in one single verse in the word of God? Right. You know, I think this has been, you know, a little over 20 minutes and that's on one single verse in the word of God that when you unpack it, just reveals the incredible power of God. It allows us to be humble before him, recognizing our position and what we are. And yet it also leads to this ability for us to think as to what next? Why? What's the so what for each one of us having read a verse like that? This was an incredible act. This was God's will at work, as you said, performed by the angels. For what purpose? And I think for many of us, the immediate verse that pops into your mind thinking through the purpose of God is Numbers 14 verse 21. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. And so the purpose of God is to fill the earth with his glory. And you mentioned as a bit of a nugget, God manifestation. I think stay tuned. There hopefully will be a podcast on that. (laughs) But to fill the earth with those who manifest his glory. God wants men and women, those he created to be like him and to fill this earth. And that's the so what for each one of us. This gift is actually being presented to us in the same way we package this verse together. In Romans 6, verse 23, we're told that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who doesn't want a free gift? Those are the best kinds. Yeah. Very hard to come by. Especially eternal life. Yeah. Yeah. We typically have to wait for our birthdays to get a free gift. (laughs) But it's a free gift given by God. And we've walked through the incredible power that he has in being able to do what he did in Genesis 2 and verse 7. So we know he has the ability to follow through on this as well. And so we're really just left with another question for ourselves. What are you going to do with that gift? Right. Will you reach out and take it? Right. Beautiful. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to tell you something about the next podcast. I didn't tell you this. It's a surprise. (laughs) You're laughing. Go ahead, laugh. (laughs) This is my thought. Genesis 2, verse 7 is actually quoted in the New Testament. Do you know where? Well, maybe I'll leave you on that cliffhanger because that will be the starting place for our next podcast. Awesome. I've been trying to share this podcast with friends and family, and after I explained what a podcast actually is, the greatest difficulty is the technical challenges. To get over this hurdle, we've made some easy step-by-step instructions on how to listen to the podcast for either Apple or Android devices. So if you have an iPhone or iPad, we have instructions for that. If you have an Android phone or an Android tablet, we have instructions for that too. All you have to do is just go to this link. It's www.essentialbiblestudies.org slash help. That's www.essentialbiblestudies.org slash help for step-by-step instructions. This is a Christadelphian podcast supported by the Book Road Ecclesia in beautiful Ancaster, Ontario, Canada. Until we meet again, dear friends, I pray to God that you may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.